you're a born-again believer here today, that you're living a life and you know that you belong to Jesus Christ and you're saved, sanctified, and set apart, you know that you're on your way home. Amen. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next year. But when you have a relationship with God, now Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the hope is in him and there's a hope that one day we will be in heaven with him. But right now, if you're a born-again believer, you may have some problems in your life. Maybe some problems with relationships, relationships on work, relationship with God, health problems, financial problems. But when you know who Jesus Christ is and the saving of your soul, when you know who Lord of Almighty God is, you may know him one time and they say he's a lawyer in a, law, in a courtroom. He's a doctor in a hospital. But do you know him as a fix-it man? When you have problems that need to be fixed, again, relationships that are broken, relationships with him that need to be mended. He is a fixer, Jesus. And we can just call on his name anytime. I know it's early Sunday morning, but when we just think about the name of Jesus and the goodness and what he's done in our life, and we recognize and we look back at our lives and say, where could we be right now? Where would we have been? Where have we been at times? Many times it was certainly not here in church on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. It's bed and sleep, maybe sometimes hungover from the night before, yeah. hanging out, being somewhere where we really shouldn't be. But this is the name of Jesus alone and him and a pardon of our sins and recognizing how good he is to us and how good he's been to us, way more better than we ever been to ourselves. That should get our blood to flow. And again, along with the music and the praises, and I thank God for so much of the toe tapping music, just get that blood flowing. But with something about the name of Jesus, he's a fix-it man, a mind regulator. Mm, thank God for him. Let us look to our Lord as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do come before your throne of grace once again, Lord. Praising your holy and righteous name, for you and you alone are worthy to be praised. As for other God, as we call upon your name, as we seek your face. Prayerfully, we come to you, Father God, where mind and heart set are broken and contrite. And that's broken, Father God, and recognizing and reverence of who you are, that we should cry out to you, Father God. Cry out to you, call upon your name as one needing your help and needing your assistance. Because we ask to enter into your presence, Father God. We ask that we pray to you and that you hear our petitions and our desires, Father God. As you give us this opportunity, Father God, we first ask that if there's anything that is in your sight, us, in your eyesight that's not pleasing to you, Father God, if we've fallen short in any kind of way, Father God, if we've missed the mark, if we sinned against you, Father God, whether it's just a relationship that's not where it should be, Father God, if we now haven't prayed for you all week long or pray like we should, Father God, we have now opened up your word and seek your presence, seek your face. But we have not studied your word to show ourselves approved. Workmen who have no need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. If we had not had a right relationship with someone else, if we went against a neighbor, Father God, not showing any love, I pray that you forgive us even now, Father God. I pray that you touch us from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. In the name of Jesus Christ, the who died on Calvary's cross, to give us the right as believers to ask for forgiveness, Father God, to confess our faults. I just pray that you cleanse us, Father God, of all unrighteousness. But have your way in this branch of Zion, Father God. Let the Holy Spirit dwell richly in each and every one of us in this branch of Zion, Father God, that you may have your way, that you may guide us, lead us, protect us, provide for us, Father God. You know what all of us are in need of, Father God, and that you pray that you supply each and every one of our needs. You know where their heart and where they stand in relationship with you, Father God. Help them, console them, Father God. Guide them. Help their minds, Father God, be at ease, that they set everything else apart, Father God. That this be our opportunity to fellowship not only with you, but with one another. That we love one another, encourage one another. That we grow together with one another, Father God. That we be living examples for you, witnesses for your word, Father God, for all the world to see. That we be a light shining in darkness, Father God. That we repel that darkness with the Holy Spirit, Father God. Proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ to all that will hear and listen, Father God. 
teach and tell and all, Father God, for you've given each and every one of us that know you a testimony, a testimony of how we met you, how we come to know you, Father God. Many of us have a Damascus Road experience, Father God, that we can't help and tell someone else about you. So I pray that you give an increase in any and all the conversations that we have, Father God. I pray that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but recognize it's the power of God. Father God, it's your will that we desire to do, and we pray that your will be done today, Father God. Hide me behind the cross, Father God, as only you can. Preach and proclaim your word to your people, Father God. Show up and show out. Have their word, Father God, hidden, have your word hidden in their hearts that they may not sin against you. For it's in your glory and honor, in Jesus' name, that I do pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Acts. We'll be reading from chapter 11, the book of Acts, chapter 11. We're starting at verse 19. I'll be reading verses 19 through 26. Again, this is the book of Acts, chapter 11. I'm reading verses 19 through 26. When we all have it, please say amen. And if you're able to stand, I ask you to stand with me if we give reference to the reading of God's word. Again, one more time, it's the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 19 to 26. And the word says as such, Now those were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. For some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with what, that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great man, a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed from for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. As we have reached, in the, again, as the men of manna was preachers and say, fix it, Jesus, we call Jesus. He's, they have so many names called him a fix-it man. And when we think about the world that we live in, in the scripture we just read, it said, now those who scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching word to no one but the Jews only. Well, we live in a world, even now when we look at our own lives, we look at the things that's going on in our surroundings, sometimes in our own homes, in our own workplaces, sometimes in our own relationship, we recognize we need Jesus to fix things. Well, no more is it more apparent when we look into the world and we see what's going on in the world. I sit there and watch news. You don't have to do nothing but watch the news for about a half hour. Matter of fact, 15 minutes. And, and you have to be able to look and say, call on the name upon the Lord and say, we need to fix it, Lord. We need to fix this world. Well, Scripture tells us so much of things that's going on. But in the world today, in, in more than 40 nations around the world, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. In some of these nations, it is illegal to own a Bible, to share their faith in Jesus Christ, or to teach their children about Jesus. Those who boldly follow Christ can face harassment, arrest, torture, and even death. Yet Christians continue to meet for worship and to witness for Christ, and the church is re- is in restricted nations is still growing. At this time here in America, if we were to do an honest appraisal of Christian persecution, we would have to conclude we don't experience anything close to what our brothers and sisters in Christ and other countries endure. However, if we ask school teacher Jerry Buell in Florida, who was suspended from his job and investigated for simply stating his beliefs in regards to homosexuality on his Facebook page, where he was discriminated against, well, he may think differently. Or Ala Alessia, who was ran off the road, stabbed and had a starved David carved in his back 
by Muslims because he wrote, wrote a pro-Israel Israel poem. Well, he may think different when we talk about persecution here in America versus the uh, overseas and other countries. Stephen Ocean and Titi Safre, two evangelists in Florida who were gunned down, murdered with a shotgun for evangelizing the word of God, preaching Jesus Christ, proclaiming the name of our Lord and Savior. And again, when we look back well over 2,000 years ago in our scripture, where it sold those who were scattered from persecution after Stephen was stoned to death, they came upon Antioch, where they first were known as Christians. One would think that such horrendous persecution of the new church would have slowed down the effect it was able to have on the first century world, beginning at Jerusalem, the, the tr tr threats. The beatings and arrests had finally given way to murder as Stephen was stoned to death for his faith in Jesus. Believers driven from their homes in Jerusalem were scattered here and there throughout Palestine. They had lost their homes and property, but not their faith. It was decided by those in positions of high places to stamp out the church then and there, but it was decided in heavenly places not to allow this to happen. We think about over a month ago, and I don't know if you heard in the news uh, about the uh, young girls that was taken from the school from the extremist Islamic group called Boko Haram, 276 young girls. Well, since 2012 of November, Nigeria has been the number one in violence against Christians. Fix it, Jesus, like you said you would. Well, we should not be shocked about the things that I've quoted and stated up front of you, especially when we look at the passage. Because again, after Stephen was stoned, they were scattered out. They came upon Antioch. They had stopped at, uh, at, at, at Cyprus, Phoenicia, Antioch, preaching to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. These were the Gentiles. These were Greeks. All this time they had been preaching to Jews only. But because of persecution, they were scattered. And as they got scared, scattered, went as far as Antioch, some of them men started teaching and preaching to the Gentile nations. Well, I just say this to you. This should not come at any surprise to us because Jesus declared it. Matter of fact, he commanded it. When Jesus was taken up into heaven by his father, his last commission that he gave to, well, next to the last, because he said, go therefore and be witnesses to, of me. But in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. They begin speaking to the Hellenists and preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture in verse 21 says, and the Lord and the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So when we look at persecution last week, I touched on persecution and persecution has can be used for two meanings to drive someone away or to pursue. You know, Paul, before he became Saul or, or Saul, before he became Paul, was one of those persecutors. One of those that pursue Christians with the purpose of killing them, destroying them. Why? Because they believed in Jesus Christ. They called upon the name of the Lord. They proclaimed the day of the Lord. But here it is. Again, the same thing is going. They got scattered and persecuted, but yet they continue to preach Jesus. Not only do they preach it amongst them their own, but they preaching it to Gentiles. And it tells us the hand of the Lord was on them. The hand of the Lord was right there with them, beside them. Jesus was right there, what, fixing their situation. He did not change or stop the persecution from happening, but he gave them the strength that they needed to deal with that persecution. He did not only allow this to happen to scatter them about, but he allowed it to scatter them about. So why? So the word can be given out. So his word can be proclaimed, and he gave the victory for others to be drawn in. This encouragement to remain true in the Lord. This is what Barnabas sent. They sent Barnabas out. The news of these things came to the ears of the church of Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Well, we talked about Barnabas the whole time. And in the last three months, we've been talking about his name, the son of encouragement, the nickname. One who persuades others to go forward, even in the midst of persecution. Well, as they had heard word back to Jerusalem that the Greeks, the Gentiles, was hit, receiving the word of God, they was believing, they sent out an encourager. 
They sent out Barnabas, the man who was known to giving out his uh, finances to help the church out in times of hard times, to help encourage the believers, what? To keep on going. Ministry is hard. Ministry work is just harder. And when we want to do things by the, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there comes persecution. There come hard times. As we were singing, fix it, Jesus, like you said you would. Because when we look at our life in times of trouble, whether it's financial or whether it's physical, whether it's security, we need Jesus to fix our problems. Well, no more times of need Jesus fixing when the times of persecution, when someone is pursuing you. And again, what we speak about so far is we may not have no one chasing us down the street. We may not have no one else in America that's going inside of a school, school taking 276 girls. That's persecution when somebody's pursuing you, all in the name of Jesus Christ. But then you may have someone that's driving you away because of your beliefs. Even when you, as you proclaim and teach the word of God, you may have someone that shun you, push you away. Man, I don't want to hear that. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I subscribe to this religion or I subscribe to that religion. I believe this or I may believe that. It may be within our own family or in our own jobs, just in the way that you carry yourself from different from other people. Fix it, Jesus, like you said you would. But we recognize as he sent Barnabas out to, uh, uh, to, to these uh, believers, Barnabas was encouraging them because these were new converts. They were new believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they knew, Barnabas knew, the times was going to get tough. Times was going to get hard, especially when you were a mix of a nation of non-believers, idolatry, sinners, wickedness, what we see in the world today. When we live in the world today, as we do to a people uh, 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 lifting themselves up or lifting up their own gods or lifting up other religions, we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be pushed away. And when we look at Barnabas, and again, let's not focus on a man Barnabas, but let's think about Jesus Christ and his goodness and mercy. He said the hand of the Lord was on them. Let's just look at God sent to encourage it. Oh, my goodness. God is so good in all that we need. Why? Because he's a fix it God. He's a loving God. He knows all our need, what we need and what we're in need of. When Barnabas witnessed this, he rejoiced. The goal of the persecution had been deterred of a stop the gospel, but it had only succeeded in causing it to spread further. Again, we recognize and we talk about Satan, Satan, the God of this world, trying to look at what he can steal, kill and destroy. Satan uses whomever he can and whatever methods he can to stop it. He's an initiator many times of this persecution. Because he's the God of this world. So when he's trying to pursue and persecute, what he meant for was to stop God used to spread the gospel. So let's not get afraid of persecution or what's happening in the world today. Because God uses that many times for his word to get spread out. As we read in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus had already known. He had already declared it. He had already sent them out to go out amongst the nations. He's not surprised at how the nations will reject his word. God is all-knowing and all-powerful. He's the creator of all the heavens and earth. He knew everything from the beginning to the end. So when he sent the disciples out to the nations and said, go there and teach them, he knew that they would be persecuted. Why? Because he told them as well that the servant is not greater than the master. They persecuted me. They will persecute you as well. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews 10. Book of Hebrews chapter 10, we'll be reading verses 19 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10. Now where it says, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Here the scripture is, is telling us to encourage one another. 
be bold to enter the holies. Just say so have a boldness. And we look back at Israel when they didn't have that option. This was to the, the Israelites, the Jews. They didn't have that ability to go into the holy of holiest. They needed a man to go in there before them. But now, because of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross, we have that same boldness that we can enter into the holy of holiest by a new and living way. Well, again, when we look at our passage reading, we talk about Christians. They were first called Christians in Antioch. This is who we are today. We were Gentiles. We were not Israelites. We were Gentiles, and we were brought into God's body by Jesus Christ. And being the first Christians here at Antioch, that's what we call ourselves today, Christians. Why? Because we're followers of Jesus Christ. But it says, encourage, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Encouraging one another. Exhorting one another. Because again, as times are getting rough and times are getting harder, we need to encourage one another, not forsaking the assembly, that we come together to lift one another up as we go through these trials and tribulations each and every day. No, they're not here happening in America just like they happen with the... Uh, over in Nigeria, but again, we don't know what each other is going through. We don't know what we're going to come across, what we're going to face trials and tribulations. We don't know when we're going to have something, but when we have a brother and sister in Christ that can encourage us, love us, persuade us to move forward, it makes it that much more easier. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Supply all of your needs. Whatever we need, based on our needs, God will supply for. He promised it. Again, he may not give us that million dollars, but he's there to supply the financial need that we have at the time of his pleasing. He may not sit there, and uh, our bodies may not be like they were years ago when they were younger, but however, he gives us what we need to, follow, to go face the trials and tribulations each and every day. He gives us the strength in our bodies to continue to carry on. And not only does he do, do those things, supply our needs, but he supplies us encouragement. It was God who got the Jerusalem believers to send Barnabas out. It's even when we face in the hardest of trials and tribulation that God is going to send an encourager out to each and every one of us. But thank God for Paul, Barnabas being who he was and acting on what God had given him, the gifts that God had given him, the desire to be an encourager, given a nickname from the apostles from the beginning. That's how we have to live our lives, that we act on our gifts that God has given us as we sharpen our swords, as we stay in God's word, as we stay in God's prayer, that we ourselves be used by God maybe to encourage someone else. He will supply all of our needs. Well, just as easy I had talked about the, the persecution of the number one nation is Nigeria. God also blesses those same nations and other nations to have the encouragement. There's a, a church or something called a satellite church. It brings theological teachings to the Middle East. And what we look at in the Middle East, and one of the things we recognize, not just Middle East, and there's a whole lot of other countries, but because of the news we watch, is so much atrocities going on against Christians as they're being persecuted. Well, one of the things that they're forbidden able to do is be taught and learn the word of God. There are some churches around there, but they're being persecuted. There's not many seminaries or places where the pastors can go to hear the word of God and be taught the word of God to teach the people. Well, one of these organizations called Satellite Church is called Sat7, what is a television ministry. They train up pastors who are unable to attend a seminary school. They do it in their home, just like cable. You know, yeah, watch how we can watch cable TV and we can watch ministries and we can watch worship service. Hopefully you're not putting that over here, us here at Man of Bible Baptist Church. Hopefully you're not forsaking the assembly of the saints. But those things are on cable. Well, it's this Satellite 7 ministry that, are, that is performing uh, 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 teaching to these ones in the Middle East so they can learn how to teach their flock how they can learn to proclaim the gospel. So again, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst that it's coming down where they're trying to take away their rights, God is still providing a way. Amen. I serve a God that will supply all of our needs. He can send a Barnabas anywhere that he chooses to send a Barnabas. He can send a Barnabas through a satellite TV to encourage them, to persuade them to continue to move on, to go forward. Why? Because they know, God knows that what's going on in the world today. He knew it from the time he created it. He knew it today, and he will know it all the way to the end. But thank God for who he is, because his mercy is rich and endures every day. 
I remember one time, it's been a while ago, and again, I'm still a babe in Christ and still learning, but I had worked in an environment where there was uh, multi-ethnicities, multi, multi um, different groups of uh, uh, cultures where I work at. And, and and I remember talking to a, a, a friend of mine who was a believer, uh, but he was from uh, India, you know, and we would talk many times about the Middle East. And I remember one time I, I thought God was, in my opinion, what God was being unfair, you know, because as I was hearing what I thought I knew about Middle East and Islam and things that goes over, I thought about Again, when we train up a child in a way that they should go, well, I thought about where it tells us this, and I thought about, well, if you have a little boy, you know, or a little girl that's being raised in the Middle East to believe Islam or any other form of religion that goes against the word of God, you know, it was like, you know, God is going to send that child or that person to hell because of what their mother and father did. You know, he trained them up again, they taught. One of the things I understand about Islam many times is through chantings, you know. Chantings are repeating words, you know, that they believe in, and many times they don't even understand what themselves what they believe in. But again, I remember questioning God many times, like that just didn't seem fair to me. You know, and I would have conversations with this man and he would tell me one day, he said, no, trust me, you know, Christianity is all around the Middle East. You may not see it on TV, you know, but it's there. You know, many times they only show you one side of it. Again, just like anywhere else, someone can choose to seek out the truth. But God had to hit me upside his head with his Bible one day, not physically, but I felt like I got hit upside his head because, you know, Romans 9, 15 said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And I remember just thinking, God, that's not fair. That's not fair. And reading that scripture and it's like, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. But that does not stop each and every one of us that proclaim the word of God and his goodness and tell him how Jesus is a fix it God and he will fix your needs according to his purpose and according to his will. And again, when we look at persecution, like we looked at the Old Testament church well, in Antioch, and again, even what happened to Stephen as a, a martyr, but God allows those things to happen for his word to be declared. Even with the 276 young girls, there's more tension on Nigeria than ever has been before because of this situation. There are more men, military nations, that are looking for these extremists because of this. But again, persecution. But God will supply each and every one of their needs. God allows this to happen for his glory. We just have to trust not only in we look at the Middle East, whether it's in Africa, we have to trust it in our own world. We have to check and trust it in our own relationship and everything that's going on, no matter what. Someone may not be pursuing you, but someone may be pushing you away. Somebody may not want to hear what you have to say or believe how you're living your life. But God will send a Barnabas. He will send an encourager. It may be not that physical body of Barnabas, rep, Barnabas represents, but that's who we should be and desire to be. But God will give you what you need. Thank God for that. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and his glory by Jesus Christ. Well, here we read again back in, uh, in Acts chapter 11, verses 25 and 26 says, what an encouragement Barnabas has for us, or what would Barnabas been to Paul? Let us remember, Paul is considered one of the most important figures in the Bible. 14 of the 27 books in the New Testament have been traditionally attributed to him, and half of the books of Acts deal with his life and works. Barnabas and Saul traveled through Asia Minor together, establishing many churches in many different cities. We have read so many scriptures and so many words when we talk about Paul, you know, Paul being uh, uh, the initiator uh, of what God had called him to go out to the Gentiles. When Paul was first uh, uh, converted on Damascus Road, when he talk, called Ananias, he told him, said, this man is my instrument to be used. I will be using him as an instrument for my purpose. This is Paul, again, that wrote half of the New Testament started churches. You hear Paul name over 278 times in the New Testament. You may have only read Barnabas' name a dozen times, but look what Barnabas is able to do, the encouragement that he was able to give Paul in the Antioch church. They stayed together for one year teaching, you know, teaching the people of Antioch, teaching them what they need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ, encouraging them to move on, encouraging them to go forward. If you look over here in book of Acts chapter 13, it says, uh, actually 12, starting at 25. 
It says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manahan, who had been brought up with the Herod, the Tetric, and Saul. Again, they took, uh, they took Mark, John Mark with them. Well, this Mark is the one who written the book of Mark. Again, Barnabas being a part of that, one of an encouragement, one who uh, 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 persuades others to move forward. A role player. Many times we may look at Bar Barnabas just as a role player. I don't know if you guys, and it's over with, I wanted to talk about this last week when we was talking about the, uh, Father's Day. You know, many of us may not pay attention uh, to the uh, basketball or the finals. I was watching the finals last week in a championship uh, between San Antonio and the Miami Heat. And one of the conversations that I always come up with every year, and it probably doesn't matter what sport it is, they always declare that who's the best, who's the greatest. You know, when we many times when we speak of Paul and how much he's done for the word of God and his believers, Paul had done so much for them. Barnabas was like a role player. When we think many times we think about the finals, and again, just using that as an example, they always compare, I don't know if you found Michael Jordan with LeBron James. Well, Michael Jordan would not have been Michael Jordan without Scottie Pippen. You know, magic may not have been magic, without uh, Norm Nixon or, again, those role players. And, and many times we may look at ourselves in here and we don't carry a title or we're not a leader of a certain ministry or we're not uh, uh, leading certain groups. But, again, when you have the ability to encourage one another, when you all of us have the ability to be a Barnabas, and many times when we see those names, it's really the role players that played a major role in so much that was going on because that's how God is. God can use anyone he chooses you if we're willing to use him, be used by him. Barnabas, a dozen times, but, again, he was right there beside Paul. Matter of fact, it tells us when Barnabas heard of the grace of God and he was glad and encouraged them that he went and got Barnabas. It says then in verse 25, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Barnabas being one of encouraging and enjoy what he said, so let me go get tall Paul. Let me bring Paul so Paul can be in the midst of what's going on here. That's what we do here at Man of Bible Baptist Church as we reach out to a community, as we reach out and do worship for others, and we, we go get our brothers and sisters. When we, as many times we come across somebody that may need prayer, well, let me go get Sister Jackie. You know, let me go get Deacon Garrison. Let me go give all because, again, I know who's those that can encourage and who can help out and share one another's when they need Jesus. They need to be it needs to be fixed. God is a God, some God who will supply each and every one of our needs. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians and we're going to read where uh, Brother Davenport has started earlier. Why does God do these things? We're in the book of Ephesians. Reading verses chapter two, verses one through ten. And the word says as such, and you he had made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, and which you were once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that of not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast. For for good works, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
God is so good in his mercy. Again, remember, God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Well, here in Ephesians, Paul had wrote that said, because of God's grace, he has, we have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, as anyone that's a gift of God, not of anyone to boast. And that goes back to even when we talk about Barnabas. Barnabas was not created himself. It was the act of God and his salvation when God had declared him righteous through Jesus Christ. It was by grace that the merited favor of God that was the gift of God that you and I alone uh, uh, can be a part of fellowship in the body of Jesus Christ. Where we said the word tells us, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before that we should not walk in them, that we should walk in them. We do a comparison. It's not of works, lest any of us should boast. It's by God's grace, unmerited favor. Nothing that we've done in the past, nothing we can do today, and nothing we done can do tomorrow deserves the salvation that God has given us. Amen. It's his mercy, it's his love, it's his desire, it's his choice from the foundation of the world. So none of us can boast. Barnabas couldn't boast. Paul couldn't boast. I can't boast. You and I can't boast even when we do encourage one another. And it's needed, it's desperately needed, and we should do it, but it's by God's grace because of who we were once at one time. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Not that we should boast, but for his work. Think about a workmanship. We are work in progress. That God is still working on each and every one of us. Many times when we look at workmanship, we think about, sometimes you think about an artist or, or, or somebody that creates, builds. Somebody has the mind, you know, many times we talk about that vessel of clay. When you're shaping that vessel of clay into the finished product that you wanted to make it to be. Well, that's how God is molding each and every one of us. He's shaping us. We're like a portrait or a painting that we still need touches, touch-ups on. The painting isn't finished yet. But when you think of the mind of a creator and his mind, before the picture is even finished, before that work of art is even done, he already has a vision of what it should look like, what he expects it to be. We are still a work in progress for his good works in him. That painting, that touch-up, that uh, uh, Picasso. You know, we may not even look at ourselves as a Picasso, a work of art, something that's valuable. You know, you look at paintings. I'm not no art connoisseur, but sometimes when I do hear about art or artwork or, or vase or museums, you know, you hear many times you see this work of art as worth millions of dollars. And I look at this work of art or I can look at something like, really? You know, because to us, since we didn't create that portrait, we didn't create that picture, we didn't, it may not be that valuable. There's no way I pay a million dollars for that picture, you know, because we, it may not have that hold that same value. But to the artist, you know, you may have art, some artists that say, you give, I give you a million dollars for that picture. They say, no way, I don't want to part from it because it's my first creation. Well, if we can look at God alone, who he, is, who he is and his mercy endures forever, that's how he looks at each and every one of us. His workmanship, his creation. It's not finished yet. Sometimes we may move while he's making a uh, portrait of paint. You know, you have somebody, you're sitting there painting a picture, and they won't keep still and just make it up. Well, that could be us. We could decide to go left or we could decide to go right. We could decide not to listen. We can decide to obey. But a God and his faithfulness is trying to keep us still, and sometimes he uses persecution to keep us still. Sometimes he uses persecution to get us where he wants us to go. That's what happened in the early churches when the disciples did not want to obey God and do what he called them to do. He sent Paul up in there to persecute them to get them to scatter to go out. So, again, we are his workmanship for his good works as he pleased. Why? Because he owns us. He created us. And then when we gave our life to him, when we said, Lord, we will live our life for you. Lord, we will die for you because what you have brought us from. Because you brought us from a mighty long way. You saved us, sanctified us, and set us apart. My life belongs to you. If you're a believer, I'm following him, and we're yielding our lives to him. Stephen, although he got persecuted, he had to be died, he died for Jesus Christ. And if he understood who Jesus was and the promises that he made, he knew he had life before, beyond that body. He had life beyond that world. Well, you and I have that life beyond that world. When we were singing that God fix it, I'm on my way back home. Well, that's how our life should be living, that this is not our home. We're just ambassadors here. 
that was sent here by God to live in this world, to be a light shining in darkness for all to see. We are a work of art for him, his workmanship for good works. Amen. So I just could declare his glory in, in, in what he's done in our lives. For his mercy endures forever. But how do we live our lives according to his will? We have to encourage one another. How do we avoid the pitfalls that so many fall when persecution drives them away? That's why persecution happens. That's why it happens over the Middle East, Africa, because they know that they want to put fear. Satan knows. Satan wants to put fear in many of our hearts. He wants to keep us from proclaiming the word of God. And on our jobs, he wants us to keep our mouths shut. Why? Because I may get fired. I may lose my job. Well, he wants to keep quiet and speaking up in our own families because I may be ridiculed when somebody don't believe what I believe. I may lose some friends. I may lose some loved ones. Persecution. But that's why we need each other to encourage one another. I've been in that same situation. Matter of fact, I've lost many a friends. Wish it hadn't happened. But again, when we yield to the word of God and we know who God is truly in our lives, and we know how he supplies each and every one of our needs. The question has to come back. Do I want to lose Jesus? And when we, which we know if you believe you can't lose him. But we can separate ourselves from a relationship from him. And where we depend on him. And he guide us where we decide to be in the world. What is that called? A carnal Christians. I don't remember Antioch being can't call carnal Christians. They were called Christians because of their life that they lived. But a decision is that portrait is that workmanship. We can decide to go left or right, yield to it or not yield to it for his glory and honor, his grace and mercy. He decides his workmanship, his Picasso. And if you was to ask him, he was here today. He may say, I don't want to give up on each and every one of them. Maybe Satan. And let's imagine this again. Look at the parable. Let's think about the scenario I just used. And I may not use it well. When we talk about a Picasso. Someone creating that first creation, that first portrait, that first picture, and that first sculpture. You know, it could be one of the things they use your first dollar that you made. I know some people that save their first dollar they made, first car. Sometimes people hold on things that's valuable to them. And somebody may come along and say, I'll buy that from you. No way, I'm not giving this up. Well, if you think about it, you think about it, and again, this is not what the word tells us, but imagine Satan goes to God. He went to Job. You know, one in a bad mouth, Job, wanted to talk about Job, hoping that God gives Job over to him so he can uh, 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 send him through all types of trials and tribulation to test him. God said, what do you think about my servant Job? If you take the hedge of protection around him, he wouldn't be who he is. He would curse you to your face. He wouldn't call upon your name. He wouldn't pray to you. He wouldn't yield to you. He's even his family members as Job was going through so much told him, curse God and die. But God looking at us said, no, Satan, I'm not giving up my creation for you. I don't care what you offer me. I don't care what you want to do, give me. I don't care what you say, what lies you tell. That's my creation. He belongs, he or she belongs to me. They are valuable to me. Even if we may not see value in ourselves, even if we don't see that ourselves as Picasso's or that sculpture, God sees why, because he knows the workmanship that he's creating in us. He knows the finished product. He knows that we could be a Barnabas and our Barnabas, the role player, to help encourage other believers that do so many more works. We may not be writing the Bible in the New Testament because we don't need to because the Bible is already written. It's already declared. It's already finished. But I declare, I call you to be a Barnabas within the congregation with the assembly of saints that you come up beside someone else and what I will use that person for. You're still my Picasso. You're still my workmanship. I have a mighty work for you to do. And that's what God is calling each and every one of us to do. Whether it's in our own homes, whether it's in our own jobs, whether it's in our community, whether it's here at Manor, and as we reach out in the community work, coming along with someone else, a believer, a non-believer, encouraging them, no matter what life is going through or what Satan is telling you, seek God. Seek his presence. Seek his face. You have many times you can have it, each and every one of y'all may have a testimony of your own Barnabas that came into your life. A testimony where somebody pulled you to the side, prayed for you, prayed with you, showed you some scripture, showed you the word of God, 
told you about the name Jesus Christ. Uplifted Lord, mighty, Lord Almighty God. And you can look back at that person and say, that was my Barnabas. That was God supplying my need because in that time, I needed a Barnabas. I needed someone to come alongside me, to comfort me, to aid me. And again, it doesn't have to be a physical person. You can say, God sent me the encouragement I need. We get it every day. Why does he do that? So we can move forward because he has a mighty work for us. And so we can teach and tell someone else that may be helping their family, helping someone on their job, paying it forward, doing with what? Jesus Christ himself first did. But you may not understand it. You may not know God in that way. You may not know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins. If you're here today and you need an encourager, you need God in your life. You don't understand what's going on in your life. Where you at? You don't know where you're going to spend eternity. You need a Barnabas, an encourager. You need someone to come alongside you. And when that someone comes alongside you, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, when you confess your faults in your mouth and declare him to be Lord of your life, he gives you the Holy Spirit. That word Barnabas, the same Greek word for Barnabas, is the same way used in the Holy Spirit, paraclete, the one that comes alongside of you, one that comes alongside you in aid to help you. Because this life is rough, and trust me, I'm, I'm no prophet, but it doesn't look like it's getting any better. It doesn't look like it's going to get easy. Because Satan knows his time is short. Just like we don't know when we're going to be taken away. We don't know when God is going to call us home. Satan doesn't know when God, Jesus is going to crack the sky and come back and claim what is his. Satan doesn't know, but he can look at the world and tell his time is short. And God is allowing him to think that he has control of this world. So he can persecute so God can show who he is. Show his might, his strength. In light of the persecution, I am God Almighty. That's what he wants us to know, wants us to declare. And as we're going through these things, we ourselves, when people are afraid and fearful of wars and the rumors of wars, we can look back and say, this is not the first time this happened before. And it won't be certainly the last time. But what you need to do is seek God out. We need to seek Jesus Christ in our life.